organizers, uh, specifically from the Cossack Dance. So in today's session, we have three speakers of eminence who would be talking about various aspects of fountain pens. This is the first time that we are trying to host this Inked Happiness Lifetime Award show at such a level. We have been together for the last two nights, two days. Extensive discussions have happened as to how to take or promote the use of fountain pens. John is a brother to me, and he has done a yeoman's work in promoting fountain pain. As he said that fountain pains are about passion. Now, but how many people here can vouch for a jota pen, biro, or dot pen, I mean, whatever you call it, as an expression of your passion? Have you used a jot pen to express your passion in a manner that you can? You know, I'm talking about eccentric people. Uh, mediocrity doesn't matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I still remember in 2012, I was traveling to Bangkok to teach. Now, here was this gentleman. I, uh, he was a businessman. He was traveling with me. I know him for donkeys. He is pretty junior to me. He calls me Dada. <coughs> so, um, as we were, you know, about to collect our boarding passes, you know, you have to fill in forms and other stuff. So. Uh, and most of the people don't even carry pens these days. And I mean, if you go to the airport, you will find people, uh, can I borrow your pen kind of a stuff. So that's a, usual, uh, that's a very usual thing now. So this guy said, Dada, uh, can I borrow your pen? Then he looked at my pen. I said, he said, what's that, fountain pen? I said, yes. Are they available? I said, yes. You use that? I said, of course. Then he said, where do you get the ink from? Now, most of the people forget that within a square kilometer area of your household, wherever you stay, you will find a Kinara shop wherein you can buy a cheap ink. It's there. Trust me, it's there. But, um, well, we don't trust. You see, it's like the word that you have never heard. All of a sudden, you come across that word. You open the dictionary find the meaning of it, and then every other thing, every other statement that you come across, you probably find that word being used. Having said that, I have another point to make. You know, uh, fountain pens are legacy statements. It is not as if you have to buy a fountain pen that, that is worth thousands of rupees or lakhs of rupees. You can buy very cheap fountain pens. In fact, the glories and art excess that we had used during the 60s, during our school days, and most of you, you would also remember that we had used that. You know, I'm, I'm sure those of you here who are our age group would remember those days. And um, those pens are still with me. I can still write with them. And if you look at a jotter pen or a dot pen, it has no passion in it, you know. They are so staid, so common, so homogeneous. There is no story in it. And writing is all about expression. How many colors can you have in a, in a, in a jot, dot pen? How many colors? Three, four? Look at the fountain pen, you know. My passion. I love somebody. And at that point of time, I am missing her. I can use a color that expresses my mind. Or I can hold the pen, look at it, and think about stuff, and then put that to paper. Jota is like, you know, you write with it. There is no passion in it. It's, it's just an accounting stuff. I am not trying to hurt the sentiments of accountants here. But that is what it is. We have with us Dr. Shobhan Rai, who is 
a scientist by profession. I can't see him. Is he still there or left? Uh, Shobhan Rai has uh, done a huge research work on fountain pens. And then I am told that we have Mr. Apurbo Panda, who is a collector of Bengali household memorabilia. It's an eclectic combination and collection of people who are here. Now, the, we have with us Sudhir Kulanikar. He is uh, by profession an IT guy. As Professor Pitkat told us about tuning pens, he is a tuner of fountain pens by passion. He is with uh, us and he will be talking about nibs. Sudhir, please come up to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, basically Chomda, Kaushikda, uh, Suparnoda, and uh, some of the other people here for, one, inviting me here to be a part of this uh, gathering, and then giving me a chance to say something about something which I'm very, very passionate. <coughs> OK. So uh, let me start with something very interesting that usually happens to me. OK. One is whenever I give a talk now, if you see my uh, uh, slide, it says uh, pen tuning workshop, OK? Down? OK? You'll have to speak in Hindi or English. Ha, OK. Thank you. So uh, yeah, I am an IT professional, but I still get stumped by technology. It happens to us all the time. Anyway, if you see the slide, it says uh, a workshop. And I conduct this workshop. I have conducted this workshop at uh, a couple of uh, pen shows. So one of the things that always I get asked is, uh, what is your authority? On what basis are you talking uh, about all this? What do, how do you know this? Is there a course? Is there any kind of official thing that you have done which certifies or guarantees or authorizes you to talk about it? So I usually give them an example. And the example that I give is in the form of a story. Now, this story happened in uh, a country. Let us not name the country for political reasons. But it happened in a country, and uh, there was a gathering, a military gathering. Okay? And there were a number of people there, a lot of soldiers. And everybody noticed that there was one soldier standing there, uh, and everyone was going, shaking his hand, saying, hello, how are you, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, people were thinking, like, why is that happening? And the president of the country also came to the gathering. He saw the same thing. He saw that the soldier is standing there. And then he realized that uh, on his uh, lapel, on his uh, chest, the soldier had a bunch of medals, OK? Like 20, 30 medals, more than anybody else. So the president thought, oh my god, this guy is like, he's really a decorated soldier. He's done a lot of things in life. So he must be really good or must be really important. So the president went, shook his hand, and said, uh, uh, Tell me, where did you get all these medals? So the soldier was a poor guy like me. He just said, sir, actually, the big one I got by mistake. And all the others I got because I have the big one. right? So the authority that I'm talking about here is I don't know what Chomda thought about it. And he gave me the second Lifetime Achievement Award. And then suddenly, I become a celebrity kind of a person. I don't mean it as a joke. I, I mean, it is a very, very important honor. It was at that time. It still is a very important honor for me. Uh, but that has, uh, so one of the things that I tell people is it's in this industry, in this uh, what I do, which is about new nib tuning and nib grinding, there is no course about it. There is no you know, degree in penology or something like that. You have to learn it yourself. What you can do is you can talk to people who know a little bit about it. I started this about 20 years back. Uh, and I have talked to some nibmeisters, some experts who are in other parts of the world. Because at that time, either there was nobody in India or I did not know anybody in India. Both of these are possibilities. Uh, but the internet helped me talk to a few uh, senior people. And then over time, I have developed this. Like Supanuda said, it is more a passion for me. Uh, and I do it. So I uh, carry out these workshops. They have been well received so far. The second question I always get is, why are you in this hobby? What, forget what got you into this hobby. 
But why are you continuing in this hobby? If you look at hobby cycles, uh, Professor Pitker talked about uh, the circle of antiques. So what, why do people stay in a hobby? It, there is a cycle, you start a hobby, usually what happens is you start a hobby with an interest, you start a hobby saying that, yes, I am interested in this, I go for a little while, that is what happens with me and exercise all the time. I take it as a hobby, I start it after three months, I give it up. So a lot of hobbies like that happen to people also. But a few people stick in the hobby. Why do they stick for such a long period of time? Now in my case, uh, I had two experiences yesterday and today which give a fantastic reason why I am still in this hobby. The first, uh, like Professor Pitkar said, I was also part of the visit to uh, Suleika Inc's factory yesterday. We had some amazing hospitality there. And thanks to all the Suleika staff and Kaushikda. I was like a child in a toy shop when I went to that factory. If you have not been to the factory, you should go. If you're passionate about fountain pens and inks, it's, it's an amazing place to be, right? Uh, Professor Pitkar said it made his day. It was the highlight of my day also. One of the reasons why I'm still in this hobby is because there is so much heritage, there is so much legacy, there is so much for us that we do not know, Pe even people like me, and I do not know a lot, but there is so much for me to learn, there's so much for all of us to learn, and it is right here in India, which is what I feel a lot of people miss out on. So that is one of the reasons. The second reason is what Professor Pitkar just showed us. There is so much, apart from what is there in India, apart from the uh, legacy and the heritage, there is so much in this entire universe of fountain pens which we don't know about. I have heard Professor Pitkar's lecture. This is, I think, the second or the third time I'm hearing it. But I still learn something new every time I hear his presentation, right? So that is the second reason why uh, I am in this hobby. Third reason why I'm, I'm in this hobby is uh, a slightly selfish reason. Uh, there are pens which are at the lower end of the economic spectrum, 50 rupees, 100 rupees. There are pens which are 15 crores, okay? But most of the pens that we use Right? Most of the people that I know use, people I meet, people I talk to, are using pens which are, let's say, starting from 300, 400, 500 rupees, and going up to, for most people, a grail pen would be like a Mont Blanc 149, which is about 50,000 rupees. Right? Some people go obviously go ahead and they buy the Hemingways, they buy the Agatha Christie's and other pens. But for most people, it's this spectrum which uh, which is where they get most of the pens. Most of my pens are in this spectrum. I have a couple of pens on the outside, but most of my pens are also in this spectrum. Now, if you are a fountain pen user, I'm pretty sure that there are times, while it's a passion, while it's a lovely thing, you really love the fountain pen, but it's like a love affair. There are times when you get so frustrated with the fountain pen. It will not write when you want it to write. It will not start properly. When you actually want to show somebody how beautiful the fountain pen it is, it will not work with you. So pens can be very cranky, right? And that's one of the, the third reason I'm in this hobby is I seriously feel that with a little bit of effort, not too much, okay, with a very slight bit of effort, people can start maintaining their pens. They can start doing certain hygiene factors with their pens, which will make sure that the pen does not give up at just the moment when you wanted to write, okay? So let me go on. While I have a few slides, I will gloss over a few of them. Some of it can be a little technical and you know, kind of engineering based. Uh, it's not as exciting as what uh, Professor Pitka showed, but if you want to learn about this, if you want to learn pen hygiene, if you want to learn uh, what you can do to make sure that your pens are running all the time, uh, apart from of course filling ink, but if you want to know what you can do uh, to keep your pens in that condition. Uh, here are some tips. Please take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, so one, what is my expectation from a fountain pen? Okay, and I'm sure this will apply to a few of you, but let, let me put myself into uh, the spot here and say that my first expectation is that the pen should write. It should write, and it should write when I want it to write, not when the pen wants to write. Right? A lot of times that is what happens. Second is it should write the way I want it to write. If I want the pen to write very smoothly, I want the pen to write like that. If I want, to, want it to write with, let's say, a little bit of feedback 
is what the term is, but it's like you get the feeling that you're writing on paper, which sometimes you don't get with ball points or gel pens, uh, then yes, it should write the way I want it to write. It can be smooth, it can be slightly not smooth, whatever it is, but that's important. And it should write like that every single time. It should not be like today it writes smooth, tomorrow it is scratchy, again day after tomorrow it's smooth. It has to be a consistent experience. And finally, I look at pens as a long-term companion. A lot of people ask me, uh, your pens, you carry the same pen every day? Yes, I do. I carry the same pen or a same set of pens. I have enough pens that I can keep rotating them. Uh, so one week I'll use, let's say, three or four pens. The next week I'll change over, stuff like that. But there are pens which come, keep coming repeatedly. Uh, there are favorites which are, are inked all the time, and so on and so forth. So, but the net result of all this is that it's a long-term writing companion. I have not, uh, I don't remember a pen which I, I have broken pens, yes, in my, um, in my learning experience I have broken some pens, but I have not come across a pen which is like 10 years old and then I say, no, I'm not going to use this ever again. If it writes properly, chances are I will use it. Okay, so uh, here are a few assumptions. I was told that this is generally a crowd of people who are aware of fountain pens and who know what they want from their fountain pens. A little mature audience, maybe not level one, but level two, or on a scale of level five, two or three on a scale of five. So one is that I am assuming that you have some basic of pen anatomy, basic knowledge. So if I say a nib, you know what is a nib. If I say a feed or a feeder, you know what's that. Uh, I would assume that you're a regular user of, of fountain pens. You can be casual users. Okay, when I say regular, it does not mean I write everything with a fountain pen, no. I could have a, a group of two or three pens and use fountain pens for a few things and uh, ballpoint pens for something else. I do that all the time. Okay. This is the most important part. You would have faced or you are facing issues or my bet is you will face issues. So if you're one of these, again, sometimes people are just frustrated with their frigging pens, so that's another point. You're willing to risk a no guarantee GAN session. Like I said, what I say is what I have uh, gathered as experience. Uh, it's pretty correct, it's pretty, uh, pretty much on point, uh, but there are no guarantees, just because you can't call me tomorrow and say, hey, you told me to do this, I did this, my pen is now messed up. I will try and help you, but no guarantees, please, okay? And if you decide to do anything of what I'm saying here, you do it at your own risk. I have to put these disclaimers because I've had instances where people have come and actually told me that, no, uh, you mentioned this. I would have mentioned it in a very specific context, but you mentioned it and, you know, I tried it and something bad happened. Uh, it happened once, but once is good enough to put a disclaimer. Uh, just for record, that once I was also able to help that person and get it sorted out, but uh, yeah, do it. But my suggestion is do it. Don't do the complicated things, right? Do the simple things, it usually works. So as a fountain pen user, if I'm facing issues with pens, what do I need to do, okay? And I have a list of about seven or eight things that you can do. We will cover only three or four right now. And that too, we'll cover one and two slightly more in detail. Three and four, I will touch upon it. I have some slides, uh, but it's more in the workshop that we talk about those in detail, okay? So starting from the top, cleaning and going clockwise, these are the kind of things that you can do. So you can clean your pens. You can do some minor bit of nib and fiend alignment. I'm not saying major work, but minor work, yes. A little bit of adjusting or, you know, regulating the tines you can do and tine alignment is what you can do so these are three or four like i said the first two are simple second and third starts getting the last three which is nib smoothing nib grinding re-tipping i am not going to cover i don't even cover it in the workshop uh, because these are extremely complicated extremely specialized things and my advice to anybody would be please talk to a nib meister if you want to get any of these done there are a few nib meisters in india uh, doing pretty good job, please talk to one of them and they will be able to help you with that. Right? Let's go. F one thing that I also tell people is that with the investment of less than 500 rupees, okay, which is the cost of a, a decent entry-level pen, you can get tools which will help you do this. 
And you'll be surprised to see that some of these are actually household tools. These are not very complicated tools. So let's start this. So a loop is a magnifying glass. Uh, this, for any pen enthusiast, even if you're not doing any repairs, uh, it, in my opinion, is a must have. And this is the most expensive uh, thing on the agenda, but a loop is a must have. They start from anywhere between 150, 200 rupees on Amazon, which is not a very good quality, but it will still serve the purpose. For a beginner, it will absolutely serve the purpose. Uh, and they go up to 30, 40,000 rupees. So if you get a Bellomo loop, Bellomo loops are slightly uh, cheaper. They are about $100 all put together. But you can start from the 150 or 200 rupee loop, which is what jewelers use. Uh, so if you have seen jewelers, they have this small thing. And the loop is extremely effective, and it is very useful also. So number one, I would recommend any pen user who is using pens more than two or three times in a week, who has faced any kind of a problem, where the pen does not write or they feel that uh, it can write better, uh, please invest in a loop. And I say invest because it is an investment. A 200 rupee loop is going to last you for several years and you're going to keep using it. Second, a lot of people sell this as tools to remove the nib and the feed from the section. Okay, You can use old bicycle tires. You can use small pieces of rubber bicycle tires. Mr. Arun Singhi is here. He is a person who uses them all the time. He's a pen maker. He can invest in whatever tools he wants, but he uses this extremely efficiently. I've seen him do it. So bicycle tires, rubber tube, uh, bicycle tubes, just two pieces, grab them, grab your nib and feed between them and pull it. What it does is it just creates a good amount of friction for the nib and feed to come out. So it creates a grip. And two, it does not spoil your nib and your feed. Because it's rubber, uh, your skin, your hand, with the light of pressure that you put, can actually spoil the nib and the feed. Third one is a bulb syringe. Not, an, not necessary, uh, but it's a good to have. A bulb syringe is a thing in which uh, you press. You can pull up water and blow it. I don't have a picture of it. But you can search for a bulb syringe. It's, very, it's a very useful thing, uh, but again, it's, it's not essential. It's a nice to have. Uh, it can be helped. What you can do is just open your uh, pen if, when you are cleaning it. Uh, just turn it upside down in the area which is connected to the section. Just put the bulb syringe with water and blow it. It comes out through the nib. Do it five or six times. Most of the times, your pen is cleaned. But you can also take a pen and put it under the tap, and it gets cleaned equally. Okay. You can pick out an old syringe without the needle or with the needle. With the needle, I don't recommend because needles are sharp things and they uh, poke you at just the wrong times. But an old syringe is good enough. Uh, or you can buy a new syringe. I think they cost 10 rupees in a chemist shop. Uh, if you just ask for a syringe without a needle, they are more than happy to give it to you. OK? A nail file or a micro mesh. Now, micro mesh is what people will recommend, especially if you are on the internet, if you're talking on groups and stuff like that, people will say, go for 7,000 uh, grit micro mesh, go for 12,000 grit micro mesh. My personal experience, and this I use it all the time, uh, there are these nail files which are available on Amazon. Uh, they are like seven-sided or eight-sided nail files. They work equally well. Again, a 100 rupee thing. It's not expensive. You don't need to invest 5,000 rupees in a set of micro mesh paper. Yes, you can do that if you have the money. And if you feel really that micro mesh is the way to go, but it's not required, in my opinion. OK? Steady hands is required because you're talking about a very small part of the pen. The nib and the feed are a very small part of the pen. Uh, yes, steady hands help. OK, a lot of patience also. Because pens are not easy to work on. Pens are not easy to deal with. So unless you have a lot of patience, it's to do with writing also. When you're writing with a fountain pen, you need to slow down. You need to have a lot of patience. So this is a hobby that actually teaches a lot of patience. Okay? And I, when I'm working on pens, would like to keep a cup of coffee or something else nearby. Uh, just keeps me busy. Okay. I think Professor Pitker showed us one picture of uh, what a fountain pen looks like. I'm sure most of you would know this. But I just want to go into this. There is a cap. She talked about all the uh, components of that. And then there is a body of a fountain pen. The most important things that we are dealing with here is the nib, the feed, and the reservoir, where the ink is stored. Now, this reservoir can be, in this case, it's a piston. It, it could be the body of the pen, or it could be a cartridge or a converter. The idea is that 
a pen works on two principles okay while it is physics and it is a lot of physics very simply put it works on two principles one is sorry one is the principle of capillary action and the other is a principle of gravity so what happens is the ink actually when you put the pen like this it flows down it starts flowing down it needs to flow down with a cartridge converter you need to make it flow down through capillary action with an eye dropper it will flow down on its own right so one of the greatest uh, one of the greatest people in the fountain pen hobby in the repair uh, this thing is a gentleman called richard binder i don't know if you have heard of him but he is one uh, who i go to and i look up to him a lot he says that a fountain pen work the working of the fountain pen is nothing but a leak it's a controlled leak it is leaking which is why fountain pens don't write upside down right most ball points also don't because ball points are also a controlled leak they the way it comes out the ball at the end of that ball point is what is regulating the flow of the ink the ink is much thicker so that is the basic difference between the two right the ones that we are talking about is the feed or the feeder that is very important because the feed is what regulates the flow if the fountain pen works on a leak principle there the leak has to be controlled this is what controls the leak okay and then of course there is the nib we saw some beautiful nibs with mosquitoes cockroaches and god knows what all on them but uh, this is what a pen is all about and we are talking about the second and the third part only out here okay so let's come to the first point what can you do to clean a fountain pen in my opinion in my experience 90% of issues that people face can be sorted out and should be sorted out by cleaning a fountain pen most of the time people who say that i have a pen which has a problem my first question is have you tried cleaning it right if you have haven't tried cleaning it please try cleaning it when you try cleaning it then second what ink and what paper are you using so that is the second question which i have most of the times the issue is because the pen the ink and the paper are not compatible with each other okay mr hero motwani was giving us an example yesterday when they were making pens they were testing a lot of pens on one particular brand of note paper and all the pens were not writing okay so they were thinking like what is this a entire batch of pens gone wrong but then when they switched the paper they realized that the paper was the problem not the pen so the pen has to be it's not always the fault of the pen if it is not writing properly it could be the fault of the ink or it could be the fault of the paper right so what do you do in such cases what i do is i have a safe ink and a safe paper what does that mean i know that this particular ink works on most papers with most pens i know that this particular paper works with most inks and most pens right so for me the safe ink is waterman blue pilot blue and in indians i use sulekha blue and i also use uh, kale blue kale was the company from uh, pune right so these are the four ones which i have and i feel personally that blues and blue blacks not even blue black so much blues are the safest inks to use royal blue is the safest ink as a safe ink for you you can use other inks but if you want to test that a pen is writing properly or a paper is responding well a blue ink probably is better blue blacks are okay turquoise is also okay but uh, i see that the more we go on the spectrum of green orange red then the inks start to get i mean start behaving a little weirdly okay so have a safe ink uh, and you know being in kolkata for you i think sulekha blue is probably uh, the best safe ink that you can get just keep a bottle of that if your pen gives a problem clean it put sulekha blue choose a good paper normal paper whichever paper you feel works well a lot of people use rodia atgsm for me the safe paper is tomo river uh it's a it's a slightly expensive paper but for me that is a safe paper i know how most inks react on that right so you could choose your own paper based on your own this thing some people use copier paper that is also perfectly fine right so if it works on that ink and that paper it is not the fault of the pen correct so that is the first thing so clean it you can do cleaning in two ways you can break open like you see the picture here you can remove everything and you can clean most of the times i do not recommend doing this just clean it what you have to do is open the fountain pen remove the cartridge and the converter hold it upside down under a tap and keep it like that for 5 minutes 
that type water is good enough to clean it. Especially if you're using a simple ink, that is good enough cleaning, in my opinion. A lot of people think cleaning is a very complicated process. I think people overcomplicate it for their own reasons, whatever it is, right? A bulb syringe is what I talked about. It's, it's nothing but a way of blowing water through the section so that it comes out quickly. The dirt, the ink comes out quickly, that's all. But normal flushing under a tap water, good enough. Especially if it's a safe ink, if it's a, if it's a normal ink. You can of course remove the nib and the fade unit. Again, if you know what you're doing, you can do this. You can do this with most normal nib units like Yovo, like Bok. Most of these are pretty simple to remove. Uh, other pens are also simple to remove. Pelican, in fact, sorry. Pelican allows you to twist and remove the nib and the feed unit and you can wash that and this separately. So some are easy, some are difficult. In fact, I would say most of the expensive pens are difficult. And I think they make it like that, right? A Mont Blanc is probably the most difficult pen to clean. The only way to clean a Mont Blanc without disassembling it is keep it under water, open the piston, close the piston, open the piston, close the piston, do it like 50 times. And that's the, the safest and the best way of cleaning a Mont Blanc pen. Other pens, there are better ways of cleaning them, okay? Like I say, in the third point, not recommended. Unless you want to experiment, unless you really are facing a big issue, not recommended. Just normal flushing would work, okay? When cleaning, what I suggest is if you, if you are disassembling it and if you have got, let's say, some gunk or something like that, please use normal water, so maybe slightly warm, tepid water is what I use with one or two drops of dishwashing soap, okay? So dishwasher soap, which you get, uh, I don't know, Vim has uh, dishwasher soap. The, the one I'm using currently is Vim with like, I think it's lime or lemon or something like that. One or two drops in a bowl of water, just put your nib and feed there, wash it around a little bit, that's it, okay? There is this chemical known as pen flush. Pen flush is nothing but Dishwasher plus water plus ammonia. So some people put a few drops of ammonia in that. Uh, it is available, some people are selling it for 500, 600 rupees. If you want to buy an experiment, buy an experiment. I personally don't recommend it. I have a friend in the chemical industry who has supplied me with some ammonia. I made pen flush, I made I think about 20 liters of it and we gave it in small bottles to a lot of people in Mumbai. Uh, maybe someone here, if you can do that, it's very simple, get in touch with me, I'll tell you how to do it, and you can circulate it within your community here. It's a very cheap thing, people are selling it for 500 rupees for a small bottle. Believe me, it's not worth it, just somebody making money, okay? So that's a pen flush, if you're using a pen flush, please rinse the pen before and after. Because flush itself is a chemical, there is ammonia in it, if that gets stuck, it, you don't know how it's going to react with the nib, uh, with the ink, sorry with the ink that you're using. So whatever you use, if you're using flush or any other kind of chemicals, there are some people who will tell you to use bleach. Bleach is to be used very, very carefully and only for select inks. The only inks that I know where bleach is required to be used is noodlers, okay? And their base state range of inks. Otherwise, please stay away from bleach. And for God's sake, anyone who is a chemist or knows a bit of chemistry here, don't mix bleach and ammonia, okay? It gives out a very toxic gas which can even kill people. So stay on one side. My suggestion is don't do anything. Dishwasher soap is amazing. Okay, and while at this, uh, if ever you get ink on your hands, and if you're not able to wash it with water, just have a shower, use shampoo, it gets washed off. Okay, shampoo is one of the easiest and the best solutions to remove it. But if you just use shampoo on your hands, sometimes it does not work. But if, in the morning, if you have a shower and if you shampoo after that, it gets cleaned out. Most things get cleaned out. I have not had any ink stay on my hand after having a shower. So shampoo is an amazing thing. So what I want to tell you is that see, it's not important. The tools that you need to get are not some exotic tools which are coming from other places. These are all very, very simple home tools which you might have at home. Most people might have a dishwashing clean. I mean, you, you, you clean dishes in some way. Just use a liquid instead of the soap or something like that. Tell your wife, mom, whoever it is, just that, get me a liquid uh, dishwasher instead of a soap dishwasher. Okay, and the last point is you can use an ultrasonic cleaner. Now this, is, this gets into the more complicated thing. 
Uh, I do not recommend this at all unless you can use the ultrasonic cleaner for something else. I use it to clean my wife's jewelry. I use it to clean watches. I use it for everything else. Maybe once in a month I use it to clean pens which come from outside. Right? I have invested in one, but then I do this on a regular basis. If you're just a regular user, you don't need this. Unless, of course, see, nothing here that I'm saying is like you should not get it. If you feel you want it, if you feel you want to experience it, please go ahead, by all means. So ultrasonic cleaner is, I think, the highest. So you use ultrasonic cleaner to clean something that is absolutely not getting cleaned in any other way. There are some people who will tell you that soak for a long period of time. Now, I don't recommend prolonged soaking for regular cleaning. Okay, if you're regularly using a pen, if you're regularly just putting the pen and saying that this is how I'm going to clean the pen, please, this is uh, more than enough. You don't need to soak overnight. Where is it required? It's required in cases where there is a lot of gunk, there is a lot of crap that has got into the nib and the feed because the pen was not used for 40 years, 50 years, and there is old ink which is there, then yes, that too, only some selected parts of the pen can be soaked for a long period of time. Right? If you use, a, for example, a celluloid pen and you soak it, it can give different results. It can be safe or it can completely dis disfigure the whole pen. Right? So prolonged soaking, actually, in our kind of use, if you are a regular user, regularly cleaning the pen, these are all extremes. Okay, let's talk about it. Now, this is something that you can do. You have first checked, you have a problem with your pen, uh, you've cleaned the pen, you've tried your safe ink, you've tried your safe paper, the pen is still not writing or it has got a little scratchy. This is where the loop comes in. Okay, what you need to do is you need to check the tie nib and the feed alignment. Before I go to tie alignment, let's first talk about nib and feed alignment. Okay, what does that do? First thing, if you see the top picture, the feed channel, which is inside the feed and which actually feeds the ink to the nib and the breather hole of the pen, which is that small hole on the nib, should be aligned. If they are like this, the ink cannot go in. So they need to be aligned together. So the first picture is how your nibs should look like. Just looking at it, it's a visual. Just looking at it visually, you should be able to make out, okay, this is aligned properly or this looks misaligned. Right, so that is point number one. There should be no gap between the nib and the feet. So if this is the feet and if this is the nib, if there is a gap like this, that will not allow uh, the ink to flow. The second uh, picture talks about how it looks like when it is normal. This is a very normal picture. Again, all you need to do is look at the nib from various angles. Right? This is not rocket science. Third one is your nib and your feet, uh, feet should fit properly into the section. Right? So if, when you put it back, it should go smoothly and stop at a certain point, which brings me to the fourth point, don't put pressure. Nibs and feeds are, they, uh, they are not very delicate, but the way they operate, if you put a lot of pressure, if it's like, you know, go all in, they don't like it so much. Most pens will, will crack under pressure. Something or the other will happen. Either the nib will get bent or the feed will get spoiled or something like that. Always use just normal pressure. There are a number of YouTube videos by Brian Goulet of Goulet Pens by SBRE Brown. You can also have a look at them. I mean, very instructive videos. In fact, Brian Goulet tells us how, uh, you know, he says don't pull like this, pull like this. I mean, pull from your elbows when you're removing the nib and the feet. Because if you pull like this, the pressure applied is too much. Whereas if you pull like this from the elbows, it actually works much better. Very simple thing. I learned that from him. Okay, and then there is a process called heat setting the feed and the nib. Uh, you can try this if you want to. I will tell you how it is done. What you basically do is once you've put the nib and the feed together, okay, take a uh, bowl of boiling water. It has to be boiling very, very hot. Okay, put the nib and the feed in it for about 30 seconds. Remove it. Take a piece of cloth, of course, just because it's hot, and put push both of them together. Okay, the nib and the feed together. What you're doing basically is removing any air gaps and making sure that the nib and the feed, what you're doing actually is number two, making sure that the gaps are removed. This also helps. It's a very simple process, not very difficult. Again, you can search online for YouTube videos of heat setting, and it's like a five-minute process. I think the longest time that it takes is to boil the water. 
Okay. If otherwise, nib uh, and uh, heat setting is a very simple process. Okay. You have done that. First, what you looked at is you've cleaned your pen. Then you've looked at the pen. You say that, okay, the tines are, uh, the nib and the feed are aligned. There is no gap. It's all fit properly. But it is still not writing. Then what do you do? This is the next level. How can you adjust the flow? Now, you can have two problems. You can have too much ink coming out, okay, which is like an excess flow. Or you can have too little ink coming out, which is a dry flow. So if it's a dry flow, you need to increase the flow. How do you increase the flow? Again, a very simple thing, also available on YouTube. What you do is you take the pen and you take the tip of the nib and the base of your thumb here, okay, where your thumb meets the where the skin starts. Put it there and press gently, very, very gently. Just press it gently, remove it, do it two or three times. Most of the times the flow gets better. Very simple tips. Unfortunately, nobody talks about these because oh, I don't know why. <laughs> but yeah, press it on, at the base of your thumbnail very gently, please. Again, with nibs and feeds, everything needs to be gentle. You start gentle, and then you start putting a pressure if gentleness does not work. OK? You can floss the tines. What is flossing the tines? Tines are the two, uh, if you look at, uh, the first one talks about uh, uh, pushing it against the base of the nib. What you can do is you can take a razor blade and just run it through the two parts of the nib. They're called the tines. There is a slit in the nib. Just take a razor blade and run it through. Again, very gently. Don't twist it. Don't do anything. Just take a razor blade, the tip of the razor blade, the old razor blade. No, people who do wet shaving, people who have razors where you have to put the blade, which is on both sides, that blade, just take it, slightly rush it through. Again, the kind of tools that you get are all tools which are used Otherwise, there are complicated tools for this also. Right? But there are tools which are available at home which can help you do it. So flossing means just basically removing it. I have not tried dental floss, but I don't think it will go between the tines. Somebody suggested to me, can I use dental floss? I said, I don't think you'll be able to get it between the tines. The gap is too less. A razor blade, thin edge of a razor blade is about what it takes. You can deepen the feed channel, don't do this. This is, again, part of the workshop. Uh, I can tell you how to do it, but I don't recommend people who don't know what they're doing to do this. Okay? Then you can also decrease the flow. If the flow is too much, if it's, if it's throwing out too much ink, what you can do is you can get the two shoulders of the nib and gently press them together. Again, the key word is gently. Both sides of the nib, press it together slightly. What it does is it brings the tines together. Okay, and that reduces the flow. Increasing the flow, thumbnail. Decreasing the flow, gently press the nib together. That's it. Okay. Then there is, of course, serious surgery. Uh, most cases, you will have to go to some repair person and show him or her what is happening, and then they can do it for you. Another thing I'm talking about, see, you may not do whatever I'm telling you now onwards, you may not do it. But if you have a loop, you will be able to at least understand that this is what may be wrong with my pen. I'm not saying it will be wrong, but may be wrong with my pen. Okay. So first is, let's look at the slit alignment. The, the slit that goes in the nib, it should be, you should be able to, if you hold it to a light like this, you should be able to see a light right up to the end. And at the end, the light will get cut off. Just, just at the end, where the tips are touching each other. That is a standard. Okay, so you can have alignment which is very wide. Again, you can look at it in a loop and you can figure it out. Or you can have unequal slits. All of this, you can't do anything about it or you should not do anything about it, but a loop will help you understand that this could be the problem. Even, even in the next one I'm showing you. Okay, this is another thing, another tip. When you're looking through the loop for time alignment, what is the right way of looking at it? It's at a 45 degree angle, okay? If you keep it parallel or if you keep it perpendicular, you're not going to be able to see what is happening. Just keep it at a 45 degree angle. So this is what a normal nib looks like, okay? When you look at it, it's like this. If, in, if the uh, slits are uh, misaligned like this or they are too far apart, that means there is a problem. Okay, so I'll just rush through this. Uh, How many of you have heard of this term, baby's bottom? Has anyone heard of baby's bottom? 
some of you have heard okay baby's bottom is something that i the reason i wanted to bring it up is because it's in my next slide which is please be very very careful about what you read on the internet especially facebook now i know people on facebook who are in this hobby uh, who are in this community for about 3 months 4 months and every time somebody says that my pen does not write or my pen starts but it stops after a little bit of time or it writes very rough or very smooth they say baby is bottom without even understanding what it means right so please be very very careful of the internet right everyone is an expert on the internet and i i am uh, uh i am singling out facebook because that's where i see most of this rubbish happening but it happens everywhere i am not on any whatsapp groups i am on a few other groups but uh, this is a very this thing i mean be very 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 careful about what you hear on the internet bad advice is free and there is no accountability people who are giving you that advice are not going to follow it up if something gets messed up okay use the internet as an information source i have a policy which says that i will if i feel i can trust it if i feel i should trust it i will but i will also verify so trust if you must but verify what you are doing okay and finally there is something called as a dunning kruger effect uh it's an interesting observation we can have multiple discussions on this but basically what happens is something like this so when a person enters the hobby okay they start out in the first 3 or 4 months thinking that they are an expert i know everything about this 6 months into the hobby they are experts they know more than anyone else there are people who have spent 20 30 40 years in this hobby who will still not tell you that they know everything else and this is not specific to fountain pens it happens in all fields okay so that is one and after that they start if they stick in the hobby they start coming down saying that oh this looks more complicated and then come to a point saying that i'll never understand it that is the next level of frustration and then slowly going back saying oh i think now i understand i personally think a person needs to spend at least 3 to 5 years in any field to get to even that will, i will never understand this phase right so please be careful about such people i see them all over the place i try to explain to people but some of these people are so popular that i have had people coming back to me and saying hey why are you saying this when such and such a person is saying something else i say please listen to that person don't come back to me okay and finally i want to leave you with two reliable sources actually three but two reliable sources one is fountain pen network this is online it is probably one of the most uh, vast networks okay it's one of the most vast sources uh, anything about any problem that you might have be you might be facing is probably there here so do a search of fountain pen network instead of facebook okay do a search of fountain pen network there are certain amazing veterans out there who will really help it is active it is not very active now but as a information source it is amazing and the the knowledge out there is genuine it is real second one i talked about richard binder please go to his site richardspens.com he is another person he's written four or five books on pens and the kind of problems pe uh, pens have he it's tilted a little bit towards vintage pens not too much towards the normal pens because he does not consider contemporary pens with jovo and bock nibs to be worth his time he has told it very openly saying that i don't even look at those pens because i don't consider them worth my time but it's still a very good source now this is a little little tricky uh facebook can still be a good source there are on facebook there are forums for let's say calligraphy there are forums for penmanship there are forums for writing and uh, professor janardhan can tell you much much more about that but there are forums there are groups on facebook where the knowledge is amazing right so we go back to my earlier slide where i say that use it as an information source trust it if you feel it is a good source who is telling you the advice who is giving you that advice but please verify it okay so facebook is another source that's all i have i mean uh, this has a few more slides but like i said this is part of a workshop so it gets into more technicality and in a workshop we sit with pens and we sit with notebooks and actually do the correction so i spoil pens i have done a couple of workshops so uh, people were very interested in that this is all i have thank you very much for being a very nice very receptive audience i hope whatever i told you is of a little bit of use to you i hope 
you know if anybody feels that fountain pens is a very crazy complicated hobby no it is not it's few things that you need to do like you do with your car uh, like you know check the radiator uh, uh, fluid level check the washer level check the engine oil if you do how to do that check the air pressure these are things that you need to do which can make your pen write very beautifully and like i said it is not expensive it is not time consuming it's very simple home things that are available in your household can help you do it okay thank you very much thank you